Uh, brief introduction, I'm Clint. Um, my background is, is operations. I worked in the casino gaming industry for a bit, open source before that. Uh, and most recently, I've been working for Dell and EMC, uh, working with a lot of storage automation and infrastructure and virtualization for the past 10 years or so. Uh, so I have a huge background in figuring out kind of new emerging markets uh, and how storage plays a role in those markets. I'm also the technical director for the code team. Uh, the code team is an open source initiative at, at Dell Technologies. We focus on uh, building community around software-based infrastructure, which is you know, exactly what Docker is fundamentally. Um, you, know, you find us in the community contributing to open source projects. You find us uh, building our own projects where we see there is some material impact that we can have that's different from other things that may exist. Uh, you also see us uh, engaging the community. So here we are at the conference engaging you all. Uh, you also see us in, in Twitter, in Slack. We have about a 3,000 person code community Slack group, which is all focused around topics, containers, DevOps, uh, and all this good stuff that's going on. Um, you also see that we have a, you'll see that we have a catalyst program, uh, which is a lot of the industry thought leaders in this space, where we promote their activities. And you know, so in all, in all essences, we're trying to uh, contribute and, and grow the community around software-based infrastructure. The last point is that you know, when we engage the community and we work on projects, we tend to, we definitely think that a rising tide raises all boats. Right? So you're not going to see us go out and create integration directly for our technology. We try to engage the community and create something that uh, moves the community forward as a whole. Uh, and, and that's really what I'm here to talk to you about today, some of the initiatives that are going on in uh, the cloud native space, uh, specifically to storage. Uh, another interesting thing for us is that we are a platinum sponsor for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, so this is a nonprofit organization that's all about sustaining and, and making the environment uh, that containers uh, can, can grow in and be used in uh, more available uh, and more uh, consumer friendly for a lot of the enterprises that are out there. So we play a, a lar large role in bringing our te technical solution leadership to the table for that organization. Uh, so let's dive into it. So cloud native and persistence, like what's going on here? I think a lot of you have previously associated cloud native to things like containers, continuous integration, um, and, and other types of uh, patterns or, or uh, ways of doing things that you want to be able to embrace as an organization. Um, but in, in this case, you know, what are we really thinking about? Right? We're thinking about making better applications. Right, we're thinking about dynamically managing applications uh, so that they can be smarter uh, and that they can take advantage of the benefits that clouds can provide. Um, so that's really what we're focused on. So as we look at the applications, right, there's uh, many types of persistence that these applications tend to need. So you know, we're talking about uh, traditional applications, we're also talking about modern applications here. Uh, in the modern applications, it's more likely that they've been architected and built to split out their data services to different uh, types of uh, you know, focused services. So you may have log streaming, you may have time series data, right? You're gonna have these purpose-built services that provide uh, the, the persistence needed for those modern applications. In addition, like below the containers, uh, we, we see, still see a lot of uh, your typical file storage and block storage, right? So it's very important in these environments to not only like satisfy the, the modern applications that may do certain things in new ways, but also the traditional and modern applications that still use file and block storage. So that's what we kind of define as the, the storage area when it comes to cloud native. Now, in this space, what's really important is that uh, we wanna be able to build uh, these Docker container images that essentially are portable uh, so we want to have a Docker image that I have in dev, ships out to uh, testing, out to production. Uh, to do that, we want to be able to choose, we want customers to be able to choose the right container orchestrator for the job. Uh, you know, that may be Docker, Mesa's, Kubernetes, right? They're all going to have different qualities and capabilities. We want to leave a choice for the customers in this space. Uh, and then we also want to have the, uh, you know, to, to enable that, you know, what we're kind of defining as a universal networking and storage interface. Right, and that's you know, one of the basics of, you know, one of the things you should take away from this talk is in the industry, uh, the, there's a collaboration going on between the container orchestrators, so Docker, Mesos, Kubernetes, Cloud Foundry, uh, to generate 
this container standard for storage to make it better and more interoperable with all the platforms that you may want to consume from. So this layer is very important for portability and it's very much emerging and it's something that some of our projects are uh, directly going to be working with. Uh, so at the end of the day, we want uh, in cloud native, I want to be able to have applications running in public cloud, consuming data services to support my applications. I want to also have my own cloud and my own data center, which is able to consume those services in a very common way. So essentially you have portability of the container image, and you also have portability to be able to leverage the data services that make that container, container happy. That's what we're driving towards. Um, in terms of the design pattern, right, in cloud, in cloud native, you gotta think about the advantages and also the disadvantages, essentially. Like, what is it that cloud is doing that I have to pre prepare for storage-wise or for more my environment? This kind of depicts that, and this is very, very important, and this is what makes storage critical in cloud-native environments. In cloud, right, on the right side, you've got an area which we want to uh, perceive as uh, where we plan for failures, right, and something that's temporary or ephemeral. And that includes container orchestrators, engines, runtimes, containers themselves, uh, and the applications, right? It, we want to be able to leverage a cloud and say, this stuff's going to fail, I don't need it, I can spin it up somewhere else. But under the covers, right, to make this all work, your data has to be stored somewhere. So what we're really accomplishing with cloud native storage is that we've got uh, a container storage orchestrator, which I'll tell you guys about, uh, which is responsible for connecting the dot between the storage resources available in a cloud and the container that needs it, right? And this is much different than where we were with virtualization. Virtualization, the storage and the, container, and the VM and the OS were all intermingled. And here in cloud native, we got a plan for failure. So separate the two and rely on storage resources that a cloud provides. And that may be in your own data center as your own cloud, or it may be a public cloud like AWS, GCE, et cetera. Uh, so how does this work today? We've got a little project called Rexray. Uh, you guys may have seen it in the, uh, the main demo area. Uh, Kenny was giving a talk on that a minute ago. Uh, there's some details there with Swarm. I'm gonna go through some pretty basics for what this is about. Uh, but here's the logo for it. That is little Rex. He's been around for about two years now, and actually this may be text Rex. We've kind of redefined this one. Uh, he's been, been around for about two years, uh, and he is uh, a managed plugin in the Docker store that's providing the storage orchestration to connect your containers to the cloud resources. So here's how it works. A request is gonna come in from a container orchestrator or runtime. It's gonna say, hey, I need a volume. Uh, Rexray is a managed plugin that's long running that is on each of the container engines. He's gonna get that request and he's gonna go work with a, a, a cloud provider. He's gonna get that volume that, uh, where the data exists and he's gonna orchestrate it up to the container. When that container is done, it stops, then Rexray's job is to detach uh, and give that volume back to the cloud resource, right? That process plays on over and over, uh, but that's his main job, is he's gonna orchestrate resources, and he's also gonna handle the life cycle of the storage. Uh, the life cycle is, can I create, remove, snapshot, you know, clone, et cetera? Like, that's, that's his job. His, he's a container storage orchestrator. Uh, he interoperates with upstream platforms, so uh, today we just had a, yesterday we had a press release. Uh, Rexray is in the Docker store as a managed plugin and a Docker certified managed plugin. He's got five or six different plugins today in Docker store. So if you look at the amount that are in there, I think there's 14 or so. Rexray is about 50% of the Docker store. Uh, and I'll tell you which platforms those are and we're getting more and more every day. Uh, but here's what happens under the covers is with Docker, uh, typically you do Docker run, that's gonna launch your, your user space containers. Uh, with the managed plugins, what happens is you, you do a Docker plugin install. Uh, that's gonna launch the managed plugin from Rexray, which is essentially invisible to your Docker PS commands, uh, but that's gonna kick off using run C under the covers. There are three different types of plugins that Docker has in the store today. It's the uh, storage networking authorization. Uh, so this is one of the key plugins. Here's what the actual commands look like. So very, very easy. So if you need to actually use persistent services, and this is common across all the platforms, you do a Docker plugin install. Uh, that's gonna do all the downloading of the plugin, and it's gonna start running it in the run C container. Once that's done, you can see that the plugin is uh, listed locally, and you can start using it. So you see a Docker run command where you specify the volume driver as Rexray EBS, and then you specify test as the volume name from the EBS uh, storage system. 
So that's all you need. Plugin installed, downloaded, ready to go, and the orchestration in the background is done to get that volume to the container that's running. Uh, Rexray has compatibility and interoperability with a ton of di different storage platforms, more and more emerging every day. I'll tell you why. Uh, but here's the ones that we support. Um, first of all, it's for any type of storage platform, block, file, object, uh, anything that we can really put a file system on top of, and anything that can have LBA or, you know, logical block addressing, those are all Rexray compatible. The, the ones in bold are the ones that are in the Docker store today. So you'll see we have all of AWS's storage, whether that's block, NAS, object. We have all of Dell EMC storage, so that's Scale.io, Isilon, ECS. These are our software-based platforms, mainly. And then you have uh, Google Compute Engine, uh, which also has block and uh, object. And then you have uh, just generally S3. So there's six plugins that exist in the store today. The other ones listed are available through Rexray uh, in a typical running scenario where it's not a plugin uh, or it's not a, a managed plugin. It's running as a service locally on the system and you start it uh, and install it using what we call a curl bash method. So still very easy, but that's the way you'd install some of those other ones. All right. Uh, so why should I care about a container storage orchestrator? Like if you go to the Docker plugin store, you see other plugins that exist from different providers. Like what makes this different? Why should I care? It's all about the user experience, right? Uh, like if you're gonna go consume persistent storage and you're gonna use a plugin, uh, you know, what's better? That you have a, a plugin which has been tested that has, you know, eight to 10 different integrations plus, uh, that has a mature CI CD system, that has a focus and intent on, the, on what it's doing, or that you have a company who's gonna build a plugin specific, you know, for a one off. Uh, I think it's much better to rely on, you know, the mature orchestrator than to have like a, a one off plugin. Uh, the other things that you think about are, um, you know, under Rexray, it's got some other value added features. So it has a centralized and standalone mode. What that means is that if you have an environment with a thousand nodes, you probably don't want a thousand Docker uh, runtimes all t or uh, orchestrators all talking to uh, S3 or EBS or anything like that. Like you're probably going to overload the API and hit the limits. So you really need like a centralization. Right, so you need the Docker engine to actually talk to something central, and then that to be able to do rate limiting, credential management, et cetera, before it talks to a backend storage platform. Right, so Rexray's got that inherent in its architecture. Uh, you also probably, if you're doing that, then you gotta think about encryption, like that's when it starts to get more and more complicated. You know, once you get Rexray at bigger scales, or the plugins at bigger scales, you gotta think about some of these other things. Um, He's also, you know, has interoperability against other container orchestrators. So Docker is the first and the main one that it's focused on. Uh, Kubernetes, we have a flex volume uh, interface for Rexray. So any of, the pl any of the storage platforms that I just talked about, they're all uh, Kubernetes compatible along with Mesos. Uh, the other thing is that it's a tool, right? So it's not just a plugin. If you decided you wanted to perform some type of orchestration operations and you said, hey, I want to use Rexray for some unplanned you know, thing that we're doing in an organization, you know, he is an orchestrator that has his own CLI, CLI tool that you can interface with. So very, very po uh, powerful for any type of use case that you guys would want to have. Now, you know, in terms of the, the user experience, I, I talked a little bit about this a, a minute ago, uh, but this is like, in terms of generating a plugin, right, we want lots of them in the Docker store. Right? We want to have as many platforms as possible. I think that's great for customers in Cloud Native and customers of Docker. Uh, but this is the reality of what it takes to build a plugin, right? And you need an organization to focus, right? And you need them to be able to, you know, create a quality user experience. And these are all the things they'd have to think about. So if you go the approach of creating a plugin all on your own, you got to handle all the stuff on the slide. If you go the approach of using Rexray and just contributing the storage driver interface semantics, then you don't have to worry about the stuff that's in brown, right? You just do the green parts. And that's the stuff that's closest to the storage platforms. So the user experience for people that gener or organizations that decide to contribute a Rexray plugin is going to be much, much better for their customers. And this is really what this ends up looking like. You know, you satisfy the core capabilities as a storage platform. That creates the storage driver. Uh, the, the abstraction is what we're starting to term in the industry as a container storage interface. So one of the benefits of also being in Rexray is that we're going to follow and interoperate with any of the standards that emerge uh, that the container platforms are adopting. So as Docker continues a volume API or they start thinking about the container storage interface, you know, we'll follow that standard. Same with all the other uh, container platforms. So the, the drivers end up getting packaged with Rexray, which is the tool. 
uh, and then we create the manage plugin from there. So that whole workflow uh, build process is all done automatically for the people who contribute drivers. It's a very simple process. And to do that, this is what it looks like. I do a simple git clone, go in the Rexray directory, specify a driver, and this would be like if I'm creating my own plugin, right, I'm gonna contribute one. Uh, specify a driver, I do a make build docker command, all of a sudden in my, uh, on my docker engine I have a, a volume plugin that's brand new from the code that I contributed. Uh, that's available, and you can see that there's a couple files that are created that really support that process. You know, as a contributor of a driver, I gotta create, of course, the bindings and what I called out in green uh, on the previous slide, but you also create a Docker file you're gonna need to create the plugin, and then a config file that, that supports uh, some of the, the plugin configurable options. So, very simple, uh, something that, you know, is gonna greatly enhance the user experience. That was it, so quick little lightning talk on what Rexray is. Uh, I think it's gonna be, um, you know, it's a very important tool today when it comes to persistence in cloud native very much an emerging space, uh, so I expect to see more and more out of it uh, in the Docker store. I got a few minutes for questions. You guys have any questions about it? Yep. So Portworx is a, uh, I would say, a, let's separate out data plane and control plane. Uh, Portworx is providing a data plane, which is a storage platform, and then they're also providing the driver interfaces, like a managed plugin in Docker. This is purely an orchestration tool, so it's a control plane orchestration tool. At some point, if Portworx decides, they could always contribute a driver, and then they would as well offload you know, the burden of the plugin development to the Rexray project. Does that make sense? So the question was, sorry, I should have repeated that ahead of time, how does this differ from Portworx? All right, so this is a control plane orchestrator. It really has nothing to do with the data plane itself, and Portworx is a control plane and data plane storage platform. More questions? The, so the end goal that, that we see, right, is that in this space, we wanna expose as much storage functionality and volume functionality up to the applications as possible. And so that means making volume functionality, storage functionality like a first class citizen inside the platforms. Uh, and, and if we can do that successfully, right, we can start to create, um, you know, a lot of what we'd call operator automation, which is focused on these applications. So in the case of, I don't know, Postgres, right, in the future, I would have something that's really automated for Postgres, so it's able to, you know, leverage snapshot features available from the cloud, and he can actually create, you know, replicas for Postgres in an integrated fashion. All right, so there's a lot of operator knowledge around you know, managing persistent applications, and we can actually you know, contain all that stuff programmatically, and we can leverage the cloud features and services by way of these interfaces in the future. Uh, so today, you know, people have basic volume functionality. Tomorrow, we're looking at raw block devices, which means uh, no file systems, just the raw blocks, and certain applications want that kind of stuff. Uh, we're looking at more features like, like snapshots and cloning. Um, so it's emerging, it's moving forward. More questions? It's got a CLI tool, right? So a Docker volume plugin. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so why is it, why are we calling it a container storage orchestrator? Why isn't it just a Docker volume plugin? That was the question, thank you. Um, it's a CLI tool, right? So first of all, Rexray, you do a curl bash and you have a binary which is written in Go that you can run and manipulate and use in any way that you want to. So it's all about how you interface with it, for one, because it's a CLI tool, tool it's a Docker endpoint, it's a flex, uh, volume interface, three different interfaces today. Uh, and then it's also got an abstraction to handle multiple platforms. So it's not just a plugin that handles one platform, it's built to handle whatever storage platform there's a driver for. All right, so it's really the front end and back end side of it that makes it a tool versus just one interface for one platform. So the question is, can it work with the VMware vSphere plugin? Yes, uh, does it today? No, we don't have that plug-in today. 
Uh, but I think as organizations who are building or thinking about the plugins that they want to create for the Docker store, like that slide where I had, here's the things you should focus on, and here's the things that you probably don't want to have to focus on, companies like VMware, and that's of course close to, to Dell Technologies, um, you know, we're going to work with them and, and figure out how to get a driver in there, because I think it's beneficial for, for the customers. And you know, we're hearing that feedback that it's the right thing to do too. So the you know, Rexray and Lib Storage are ready for it. Uh, and we're you know, eagerly looking for people to come join us uh, on making it more functional. Yep. Will uh, Azure plugin support be coming soon? Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we're always looking for contributors, so it's actually pretty easy. It's a matter of uh, you know, the testing for it to make sure that it's working as expected. But uh, Azure is, uh, the question, I'm sorry. Uh, the question is, is Azure support com coming? Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, it is a driver today for unmanaged disk. We got a question about managed disk uh, actually yesterday, I think. Uh, but the plugin will come soon after. Uh, yep. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is can I run Rexray uh, and have it work against, you know, Docker Swarm or, uh, you know, GCE and cloud platforms all, and, and the answer is, is yes, um, and you can do this in a couple ways. There's two operational modes of Rexray. One is a standalone mode, which means that you have a, a Rexray standalone instance that includes the storage driver, which gets deployed to every single engine in the Docker world. Um, and then that controller or Rexray instance would be configured for whatever st storage platform you want to use. The other alternative, though, is if you use the centralized controller mode of Rexray, you would deploy the Rexray client or agent, which is a lightweight Rexray with no storage driver, uh, and that would go to all the nodes, and then you'd have a centralized controller, which you then configure, and you say, he's gonna handle you know, GCE with these parameters, he's gonna handle another platform with these parameters, and it's all about the client accessing the service that that controller Rexray is advertising. So yes, you can intermingle services, platforms, like it's, it's all gonna work, that's what it's built for. The question? We're working on the, uh, the managed plugin for that. Uh, so the question was, under the centralized deployment, the controller method, are there managed plugins for that? Uh, today it's expected that you're gonna use uh, the, the typical install method, which is just deploying the binary and starting it as an init service or a systemd service. Uh, but we are working on where you can have the, the managed plugin be a Rexray agent and another managed pl plugin being a Rexray controller, and the configuration or environment variables kind of determine the configuration at that point. So for now, the controller mode is not managed plugin, but it will be. Yeah. So like last question, is that? Okay, last question. So uh, other than, so you mentioned something about thousands of uh, instances, thousands of EBS, or you know, some technical something. Yep. Right, so uh, other than setting up the volume, is this doing anything else? Because uh, as I'm accessing volumes and stuff, it's not going through X-ray, right? So, so the, volume is mounted. So the, the question is, uh, other than the, the orchestration, uh, you know, when I have a large environment, is Rexray doing anything else for me? So uh, other than attaching, detaching, mounting, unmounting. Uh, so there's two sides of Rexray's functionality. One is the orchestration, which is what you've covered there. Uh, the other is the volume lifecycle operations. And the volume lifecycle operations would be, can I create, remove volumes? Uh, can I snapshot? Can I clone? Stuff like that. You know, the create, remove are the additional lifecycle features that Rexray does today. So, okay. That's it. If you guys have any more questions, feel free to see me. Thank you. Hey everyone, my name is Chad Thibodeau. I'm a product manager from Veritas um, Technologies, and I'm going to talk about predictable performance and data protection for Docker container volumes. So I know this is 20 minutes. Um, I definitely want to get through this so we have time for questions at the end. Um, so let me start with, many of you may be familiar with Veritas, many may not, um, but just to kind of level set. So Veritas, the company, actually developed one of the few file systems, and I just had to double check and confirm it for myself. So back in 1991, so we go back that far in terms of our storage experience. Um, we recently split from Symantec, and as part of that activity of splitting, now we have 
a very singular focus around data management. So there was, again, a time when there was security involved in that with the uh, semantic play, but now we are singularly focused on data management. And so basically, as you kind of look at this, what we're looking to do is through kind of these three main areas, provide a 360 data management um, solution for customers. Now, we're not going to talk about all these, um, of course, but this is just to give an idea of kind of the breadth of our portfolio. So um, if you look at all the different products, again, you have things ranging from backup to disaster recovery to um, information visualization to storage. And again, obviously, today, the, the key is to talk about storage for containers. So I put together just what I would say is a very high level um, kind of evolution for container storage. So you have starting from your left, I guess my right, um, that's Ceph, so that's Red Hat, right? And basically Red Hat's been working with containers for well over a decade. Um, it's Docker that really brought containers to the forefront, brought all the excitement around containers, but nevertheless, they've been around for quite a while. Um, then as you kind of progress, Hopefully that should be familiar, that's Kubernetes. Kubernetes now, you know, again, being open source, but they are definitely getting into more um, advanced storage services that they're looking to provide, um, storage persistence as an example for their pods. As you progress, again, that is Cluster HQ, unfortunately now a legacy company um, since they uh, folded last, I think it was right around Christmas. Um, but what basically Cluster HQ did is they provided this storage management layer that sat on top of other storage providers so you could run a heterogeneous storage container environment um, or container storage environment. And then as we go finally to the far right, that is our logo. So this is the Veritas hyperscale for containers, um, which again, I'm gonna get into here in, in a bit. But now what we're looking at doing is providing the enterprise class storage services and performance that customers not only expect, but that they really need to be able to deploy their applications in production. So kind of taking maybe a little sidestep, um, and again, I don't, I don't expect that this is very, or should be new to many of you, but if you kind of look at different workloads that are running in container environments, right? So whether it's databases that are gonna need persistent storage, whether it's web services that are gonna to need to address management and scale, um, online transaction processing, right? You see scale security and persistent storage, et cetera. Um, and then like homegrown applications, which probably need some or have some form of challenge of all of those. Um, what we are uh, addressing with our hyperscale storage for containers is the persistent storage problem. There are other ecosystem partners from Docker that are gonna be addressing some of those other areas. But that is really our focus today is to solve that persistent storage problem for containers. So now getting into it. Um, so I know there was a question from the previous session around uh, how Rex Ray differed from Portworx, for example, and um, the gentleman discussed data plane, compute plane. So let me discuss our architecture again at a fairly high level during this quick lightning talk. So we have the concept of a compute plane and a data plane. And the idea is really with hyperscale, as per its definition, is to separate these two planes so that you can actually scale either one independent of the other. So if you need more performance, you scale the compute plane. You need more capacity, you can scale the data plane. Um, by having this two plane architecture, what it allows is it allows the ability to define quality of service. I'm gonna go into that in a second, but um, traditional quality of service where you can define you know, some threshold of performance. Um, and then that actually is all staying with the application up in the compute plane. So what we're trying to do is make sure that the application gets the highest performance storage that it can. Um, and then down in the data plane, you actually do the other storage services. So it could be snapshots, it could be additional replication, um, it could be eventually an integration with backup, for example. So, so that's the concept. Um, I will s maybe kind of preempt a question around how we differ from some of the other storage products out there. I think, again, the idea of um, focusing both on quality of service as well as data protection is one thing 
that is unique with uh, our solution. And in addition to that, again, Veritas has been in the storage business for a long time. So we have not only the pedigree, but we really have the understanding of the problems that customers face with their storage um, in, in supporting their applications. So predictable performance via policy. So I mentioned the idea of you can actually define a quality of service. Um, so it could be for IOPS, it can be for latency, it could be for both. So you can define both a min and a max. Um, and again, that's to address the uh, often term noisy neighbor issue, no different than what happens with virtual machines. Um, it also is configurable per volume, per container volume. So again, by creating these policies, you now could apply it to one container volume in your environment, or you could spread it and apply it to multiple container volumes in your environment. Um, and then the thing that the, is the last bullet in italics there is, um, so we are also looking at evaluating what the overall um, capability, performance capability is of the node to ensure that you don't actually over-provision the performance for those container volumes. So basically making it a lot more um, hardware aware, if you will, or performance aware. And then uh, just a quick screenshot of the user interface to just reinforce. So again, this is where you would define a storage policy or you could leverage an existing one um, and apply it again on a per container basis. So then in terms of data protection and resiliency, so again, you have the ability to um, define a replication factor um, for both your compute plane and data plane. And so this is again to provide that high availability. So in case you have either a potential node failure or corruption in either plane, um, you're able to instantly recover from that. Um, in addition to that, you have the ability to configure your snapshot frequency. Um, and so, and again, I'll have a screenshot here in a second. Um, and then I would say probably the most important thing here is that last bullet where because thinking back to the data management that I showed you earlier, Veritas has a broad portfolio of products. And so the idea is we will be integrating these additional pr um, products of Veritas into that data plane. And what's important about that is by doing that in the data plane, the intent is to have no impact on the performance of, of the actual applications, those container services that are running in that compute plane. So all of this would happen down at that data plane layer. Um, and from my understanding and, and kind of being in this uh, container journey for the last couple years, there really isn't a good backup solution for containers. And so this is, again, a great opportunity for us, having been a backup provider for, again, many, many years, to actually fill that void and fill that gap. And then uh, again, screenshot, very similar to the one you just saw, the difference is um, it's just showing a goal policy where you have you know, a, a different availability factor as well as a different snapshot frequency. So just trying to kind of highlight that. And then finally, um, simplified management and API support. So, um, let me explain quickly, the, the way that we actually developed Hyperscale for containers was through a microservice architecture. So we're kind of coining the phrase PowerPoint to product in a, like four months. So we literally went through an agile process using microservice architecture, developed this product, and it is delivered as container images. So there's basically, I believe it's five container images overall that make up for um, the product. There's a volume plugin and then there's different services for whether it's the IO or device um, management, et cetera. But I think that's actually important. And in addition to that, we have full API support. So we were very conscious of knowing how people actually consume and adopt these new technologies is you have to support APIs and RESTful APIs um, for that matter. Um, and I think the other thing I just wanted to touch on is around the self-provisioning. So the idea is to make this as easy and user-friendly um, for the uh, consumer as possible. So if they want to use the Docker universal control plane to provision the container volumes, they can do that. They will then automatically show up in our UI. Or from what I showed, and I guess I'll pull it up here, if they wanted to create a volume, container volume from our UI, 
it will then get mapped and show up in the Docker universal control plane. So again, wanting to make sure that there's that full visibility for the user so that, you know, however they're most comfortable working with containers, we support. And then kind of just to close on this in terms of, so we announced our beta version at this conference. So I've actually attended the last four Docker cons um, at, while at Veritas and myself as the PM, super excited that we finally actually now are exhibiting at DockerCon. We have a product. Um, again, it's in beta. We have the ability for people to be early adopters. So kind of the marketing pitch is, you know, please come by. Um, see a demo, so we have demos, so you can see, you know, what the app product actually does, how it works. Um, do a survey, you can win a GoPro, um, get a t-shirt, etc. And I think with that, um, I want to thank you guys, and then I'll open it up for questions. Yes? <laughs> so the question, yeah, no, good question, sorry. So the question was, how is this different from hyperconverge? So here's my take, so this is Chad's opinion, but so you have hyperscale, you basically break apart, right? So you, again, have this ability to where you can scale compute and capacity independent of one another. Hyperconverged is really the opposite of that, right? The intent for hyperconverged is you're trying to bring everything together so that you have what claims to be a better overall user experience or easier deployment model. So now you've combined compute and data in a single appliance, right? So again, as we can say, you know, think Nutanix as an example for hyperconverged. So again, I would argue they're potentially competing architectures, but you know, they are at kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. Does that answer your question? Okay, other questions? Yes. Ah, uh, great question. So the question was, what's the difference between volumes and just regular data in terms of backing up. So first and foremost, if you think of a microservice architected application, um, it's kind of like a spider web or a nest of all of these different services that may have some dependency on one another, right? So in terms of backing up, the challenge is I think exacerbated because let's use the example of I wanna back up some monolithic application, maybe it's Oracle, it could be you know, some other application. Um, I basically have to back up that application. I'm gonna have to do certain things like you know, take st um, state and everything else, but you're not gonna necessarily have all of these separate little dependencies and modules. And so, again, I would argue that backing up of microservice applications is exponentially more challenging than traditional backup. Does that make sense? Thank you. Any other questions? I think I probably have just one or two minutes. Any other questions? Okay, I think we're good, thank you.